All right. Um, okay, cool. Sexual designer. To join. Hi. Hi, Maria. Hi, it's good to see you. Oh my God, <laughs> it's been so long. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Happy Friday. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, awesome. So, uh, Mariana, uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I've been following you for a while, and I also took some of your courses. I know. Uh, I know. The fluidity courses, the metaverse courses. So, uh, I'm really excited to hear like a little bit more about your thoughts about where you're taking your uh, practice or your professional work. Um, so yeah. before that, uh, if you mind uh, giving us a little bit of introduction of your background, uh, how you started in architecture, where of you course. went, and then where you are now. Sounds good. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I know I have some students here as well. My name is Mariana Cabuguera. Uh, I'm an architect. I'm Portuguese. Um, most of you know the story already, but I'm sorry to bother everyone again. But I moved from Lisbon to London um, to pursue design in architecture. I think we all know that architecture in um, some of the Mediterranean, not so, not only just the Mediterranean, but the old countries, architecture is pretty conventional. That was one of the reasons why I moved and decided to do a second master in architecture to London. And in London, uh, the master's I did was Design Research Laboratory in uh, the Architectural Association. Um, it was a pretty hardcore course. It had a very big and very good introduction to technology and architecture. Um, I kind of did okay. I did pretty well, so I joined Zaha did afterwards. And uh, I joined Zaha as an architectural assistant, stayed at Zaha for, well, five years. And then on my last year at Zaha, I was invited to be architect director on a Web3 company. Um, and I always like to tell everyone what Web3 means. So it means that it's not just metaverse, it does develop everything that is Web3 related. So NFTs, uh, uh, coins or not coins, cryptos, they actually work with cryptos. And the metaverse, and they had no architect running the, arch the architecture department. So they asked me to be the director of that department. A year later, they asked me to be the art director of the company. I took the job and a couple of months later, I actually uh, left Wild World uh, to open my own studio and to dedicate my full time on, on this, on the new practice. Pretty long trajectory already. <laughs> a lot of stuff that you've done. <laughs> um, and I, I guess I'm curious, like, why did you step from traditional architectural practice, like from Saha, to uh, the, I guess, like the metaverse or the more digital space? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's the most common question is why did I take the risk um, and move from a conventional practice to a purely digital practice? Well, first and foremost, I think it's important to know and to understand my role at Zaha has always been an uh, architectural designer. Um, and most of the projects that I've done, and I mean like 99% of the projects I've done at Zaha, they were not um, projects that were developed on site. Or, projects that were developed further than digital, their digital means. So in that way, um, your, your role as an architect in, for a digital environment like Metaverse is exactly the same as your role at Zaha or any office where you're not developing a project for construction, you're developing a project for competition or your project is still like on their digital format. So it was a, a very easy and smooth transition. It, it was a, a logical one. And that uh, that's the part where it comes to what skills do you have? So I had all the skills to develop arch digital architecture. And then um, there are a couple of personal reasons, obviously. So I was 32. Um, we don't have many chances to take, to take very big risks in our profession. So I knew this was going to be a very big risk to move completely. And I decided like, you know what, like if I want to take a risk in the profession is right now, uh, I have no one depending on me. I'm not a mom. I don't have, like, I'm not building a family. So, uh, right now I'm solo, I'm flying solo. So it's the time to kind of like, let's go, let's give everything you have. Um, so that's one another reason. Another very big reason was I was given a role that I knew I had the capacity for, which was a lead role. Um, and I was not 
getting gotchas uh, at, at my former project, at my further, former office, um, the leading one. And sometimes it takes very long for you to get that and you're just delaying something that you know you'll be good at. And you need to learn even the role of being a lead. And I was not getting that chance. So when I got the direct title of lead and director, I was like, let's go and I'm gonna, I wanna start learning now what it is to, to be a lead and to be a director. And then obviously, um, I think we should all be aware about the, um, the revenue and the salary and the money that is happening um, on our practice when it comes to digital environments. Uh, when, when, whenever our practice is very close to technology, we are talking about big investments, uh, big revenues and bigger salaries. Okay. Um, the, the more traditional our job is, the less you get from, from investing and from investors. So the salary I was given, it was absolutely, um, way off the salary on, on a traditional practice, like completely on another dimension. Um, and that's something that I'm, I'm always, I know it's a very uh, fragile topic and uh, we all feel so unstable when we hear about salaries, but it's very important that we start sharing this in our practice. Um, so since the beginning, I've been very transparent about that, about the finances that are, that are happening on, on metaverse environments or web three environments. So all this combined, uh, and I needed like two months to think about it. I asked them for two months. And, and then I was very convinced that after Zaha, Zaha is already like one of the best offices in the world. So after Zaha, I would either open my activity or I would take a big risk and see the other side of architecture in digital uh, landscapes. And that's what I did. Interesting. Because some of the things that you talked about, people consider them taboos, right? Like nobody wants to talk about their salary. Um, yeah. Or, or at least from an architectural practice, people um, I know. sometimes assume it's, it's not a higher salary compared to other professions, especially in the digital space. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Any profession, not, not just the digital space. <laughs> and it's kind of, it's, it's kind of wild though, because like you said, you had all these masters and stuff like that. And you would imagine like at that point, like you still have like a pretty high salary, um, but it's not comparable to other ones. So I guess, um, so now that you moved to like the digital space, um, did you learn new skills to what you were doing before? For example, you're talking yeah. about like being a lead now, uh, were you still doing design work or now were you kind of like more, uh, finding talent and then guiding them through like the work? Can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? So I went through both stages. Uh, in the beginning I was doing everything. Uh, and it was extremely overwhelming. Also, they found out that I was, uh, I had a master's in urban planning. So I was also doing urban planning of a whole city. And that includes also real estate. It was insane. It was too much. It was design and, and urban planning. And in a month I was like, okay, I need to grow my team. And they were like, okay, let's go grow your team. I grew a very solid team with very good people. Um, all of them worked at Zaha because we have similar skills. So I was very comfortable in, in having them. And I, I still, I really like to work with them still. Um, and then that's when I stopped at some point, halfway through, I stopped designing at all. Um, and I was just uh, managing and coordinating uh, and planning, a lot of planning. And funny enough, uh, I love designing, but I did not miss it. Um, I really enjoy strategy and I really enjoy planning. Uh, so that's exactly what I was doing. And, uh, I, I never regret not being, not designing. Uh, also I was doing studios and workshops and, uh, these workshops, they actually forced me to design. Uh, so it was good. It was a good compliment actually. So that was kind of the skill that I learned the most was to lead and, and to direct and to create a strategy for a company. Uh, yeah, that was really, really fun. Um, I'm assuming now at this point, you're applying those to like your own venture, right? So you have, uh, Mariana Camugina studios, uh, mm -hmm. maybe talk a little bit about your strategy in that. And what do you, uh, I guess, what do you seek to do with this practice? I did read in your bio that you said like it's an AI powered design practice. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming you're combining all these, uh, knowledge that, that you brought from like Saha to digital uh, exactly. the world. And then Big what are you doing now? <laughs> you got yeah. It. So talk about so, what you're doing now. Yeah. That was
What was the plan since the beginning? Uh, when I saw the potential of architecture in digital spaces, and I was still at Zaha, um, I knew that what I wanted to do for my own practice it would be both, doing both and offering these two ser industries, these two services. Uh, knowing that one will get a lot more revenue than the other one, which is a digital one, and knowing that one will require and it can afford to have investors, which is something that in architecture doesn't do, right? No one is investing on an architecture practice. But people are investing on tech companies that do architecture or do digital design. So I want to pause. Uh, so that was another reason why I left Saha because I was learning that I learned the conventional architecture in one of the cathedral of architecture in the world, which is Ahadid Architects. And then I wanted to learn the Web3 side and the tech side from one of a very, very big tech company, which is Wilder World. Um, and as soon as I was completed and I had my complete knowledge on Wilder World, which I think it, got, it really reached the limit. I was ready to, you know, get them together and like, okay, let's let's do both. So that's exactly how I kickstart the studio. Um, I also learned very tough uh, lessons at Wilder World. Uh, it, I, like I said, I knew it was going to be a very risky job, and I, I did get my I did get my punches in the face actually, pretty hardcore. Uh, one of the lessons was. Um, I don't think architectural practices are ready. I don't think the industry is ready for architectural practices to focus only on digital environments and on immersive experiences. Uh, the industry is not there yet. Uh, technology is not there yet by far. We still need to go through the whole AR uh, revolution and the whole AR hype. Um, and after and before, uh, uh, only after AR, we're going to get the VR and we're going to get the metaverse. So we still have the AR in front of us. And that was one of the reasons why I decided, okay, my, I need to leave the company. The company was also getting to a not so great stage um, because of exactly what I just said. Industry is not there. Um, and I'm going to start my studio that actually hybridizes both. Uh, so right now I'm doing a project for construction and I'm investing on a product that will be working only for uh, digital and metaverse spaces, which is almost like creating an, like a startup. Um, so I'm doing both and that's exactly the core of the studio. The part of the AI, um, AI has a very different dimension on, um, on tech companies that, and I mean a different I mentioned when we compare to the ones that we see in architecture, so it's not for generative images, it's not for generative design, it's not about mid-journey, not, not about stable diffusion, it's not about creativity. AI enables um, one very important, important part of the metaverse, um, and, and you see it within in NVIDIA, when it comes to NPCs, um, when it comes to populate this, a space with, with, and I think we all know what NPCs are, right, like uh, non-playable non characters. And AI enables to uh, fill up a space, for example, uh, concert hall imagine. You walk in a concert hall, digital concert hall, and you see five people, they are organic people, they are real players, and you feel like it's a flop, right? You feel like, oh my God, this concert, it's five people and 200 seats, you probably leave. Um, and what AI is be that is being developed by NVIDIA right now is to actually generate um, NPCs that are as organic as playable characters. So you'll be walking into this concert hall and you'll be seeing 200 people uh, behaving, not, you know, like NPCs, behaving like uh, actual people behind their characters. And that's what makes the space successful. Uh, as architects, we rely so much on this. So success of spaces rely so much on um, how many people, how many active people are in there. And this is what I mean with, and this is what the studio means with implementing AI into metaverse spaces. It's not so much for generating images or not so much to um, complement creativity. It could, but it's not really. It's more like on, on the tech behind. To the tech behind it. Um, you, you mentioned something that maybe the industry is not there yet for metaverse, and that's kind of like one of the reasons uh, AR, VR uh, recently, like uh, Face uh, Meta released kind of like this headset that they were mapping, uh, like that interview. I don't know if you saw with Lex Friedman and uh, and uh, Zuckerberg yeah, that it was it, it's supposed to like be that next level where like now everything can be uh, viewed in like a VR space. Um, mm -hmm. 
And I, I guess like the, the reason that I, the metaverse didn't, like, I guess it hasn't like the hype didn't reach the, the, the output. It's because like people don't have that immersivity, right? And you talk about immersivity and how to build like an immersive space with like these AI uh, people. So do you think by doing something like that, that architecture could take a different role in, in the digital space, like to be able to have this immersive spaces digitally, or is this something yeah. more where you you're doing it, um, you're doing these designs and then inhabiting with people as a mm. way to like showcase like a real project? Uh, don't take me wrong, Daniel. It's not like it's not that Metaverse hasn't launched. Metaverse has launched. It has launched exactly. Uh, it did not live up to the hype, but that was not the. It was not the time to to be living up the hype. It is, pre it is behaving exactly the way it was predicted to behave. And it is on the stage that was exactly predicted to be at. Uh, everyone knew when the metaverse hype started where technology was at. It was not like Zuckerberg decided like a hype and he hyped metaverse to be exactly at the stage that we are right now. Um, so it is going according to plan. As architects and as any human beings, our creativity has no limit. So we thought that tomorrow we would be jumping into our second digital life <laughs> because they are great at that. Um, but the reality is the hype was needed to kick start and to start and to put the seed of the metaverse. And now it's flowing at the pace and the speed that was predicted to be flowing. It's probably even faster than was predicted to. Um, for example, there was a very interesting article that just came out from um, Improbable. Uh, Improbable is a, a very big, um, almost like a server for Metaverse, or for everyone to understand, it's almost like a Netflix of Metaverses. Um, and they are here based in the UK, they are geniuses. They actually got the revenue that they lost last year back this year, just in, in the next six months, um, just by investing on esports for digital environments. So it is, start, it is happening. Um, it's just not at the level that we all wished and we all can imagine it to be. So when you understand this, um, you obviously get a bit of heartbroken because <laughs> it's obviously slower than you thought, but um, you also understand that the wave is there. You either get the wave or, or you don't get the wave. For an architect, what will really satisfy us, like the actual metaverse that will satisfy us is the one that is high res, uh, AAA quality, uh, absolutely hyper realistic. That's what the architect wants, right? It's what the architect dreams. Um, absolutely immersive, probably with the ability to smell and to sense smells. And for that, uh, I know. for smells, I'm not even gonna, gonna get started with that. But in ten years, we will get the high res, uh, immersive spaces. Right now, it's low res, and it's fun. It's still happening, it's still generating revenue, but it's low res. Still fun. So for an architect, you still jump in this way. I guess like the tools that are being used to create, I guess the highest fidelity right now at the moment that you use, you're using. Um, I didn't get the question. Can you repeat? Sometimes you, you get like muted. Ah, you are muted. I think I know what you ask you're still muted but why are you fixing your settings um right now high fidelity is happening outside of uh digital spaces so outside the metaverse actually it's happening in unreal engine by epic games uh the level of high fidelity everyone is wishing for when you're using unreal engine is like gta uh quality so that's the bar uh, but as you know gta and everyone asks so why don't we consider GTA as a metaverse. Well, GTA is a programmed map uh, and your player will only do the parts of the map that GTA wants you to do. Um, it's an open world, but there are parts of your map of your, imagine that you're seeing it like in, in plan that you cannot go. On a metaverse, you should be able to go anywhere. It should be exactly like your, your real world. Um, also, there's a limitation on, on the number of players. So GTA has a limitation of number of players. Metaverse does not, should not have a limitation on number of players, right? So it's this kind of thing, things that it's still not enabling the actual metaverse, but it's, you can see it on GTA, what's, what's the level in Unreal Engine that it could reach. Um, everyone is hoping that Unreal Engine is, is building a metaverse, but I honestly, I have no idea if these guys are or not. 
I really hope so. <laughs> like, really hope so. Now, you still... ah, I got do it. you hear me now? Yeah. I, I guess, like, I, I'm always wondering now, what is the connection of all this to traditional architecture? And how <laughs> do you connect these two worlds? Or would they remain, remain kind of like in their own routes? No, they are absolutely the same. Uh, I, one day, one time I was at this DRL uh, final presentation and Philip Morel was there. And I will never forget, they, they were presenting a Metaverse uh, project from Patrick Schumacher's team. And Philip Morel was super skeptical and it was two years ago, I think. He was really skeptical and he said something like, so what, what does this mean? Does this mean that all this library of projects that I have on, in my office, they could be metaverses? And the re simple qu answer is yes. <laughs> but it takes, uh, architects, they always, they are so skeptical and they always doubt. So all architects would think like, no, it, it has to be more, it has to be more complicated, it has to be more complex. No, it's not. <laughs> you know no your library and not not everyone can can afford to have this this is for our profession period it's not for a surgeon it's not for a lawyer it's not for for anyone else that is outside the design industry designing virtual spaces was meant for our profession so that means that we have total skills to actually be the ones designing 3d spaces this is what we do every day um and this is coming from someone that did this for a whole year, every day of their life. I did this every day. Um, and it's basically the same workflow. All of our 3Ds, all of our um, spaces, all of our designs, they don't need to stop on conventional sites. They can be digital sites. Obviously, you need to collaborate with other type of people, and that's another whole other story. And you need to integrate gameplay, and you need to do like a billion of other things. But before that, the practice is literally the same. It's like the first chapter of architecture is exactly the same of the first chapter of designing digital spaces. It, and then you start having different, different nuances of each profession, obviously. And you also said that you're also gonna be doing uh, real projects. Uh, do, you, do you wanna talk maybe a little bit about that and, and what you, I guess, uh, plan on doing with real projects? Are you treat them also as yeah. a product or, or like, no. as a, like a client-based relationship? Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's the typical client-based relationship, unfortunately. And it's boring as hell, <laughs> but uh, it has to happen. Actually, I got a very interesting project and I mean, I cannot complain. Like it, it is a very good one, um, but the time spent um the bureaucracy it's so long and the way you you get the revenue is also super long it's a, the traditional unconventional pace uh in architecture and um and yeah i mean it's not as exciting as developing a product for something that has tech and that is revolutionary like designing three-dimensional virtual spaces it's still it's still more exciting but yeah, I mean, it's what we what we sign up to, right? So, and then Mariana, you have also been teaching for a bit, um, and your workshop courses, and but you also have like a several other workshops. So, yeah. can you talk a little bit, maybe about I guess by educating uh, designers and uh, I guess these tools or these kind of like virtual tools. Uh, do you think this is something that should be done in architectural schools? Like this should be kind of like a base level that people should, uh, students should automatically, uh, learn. It's a, it's a good, it's a good question because not everyone should be forced to be, um, doing a special side of architecture, which is design. Um, and it will also take very long for academia to catch up with with technology even for us to catch up with technology whenever we get to academic stage and academic teaching jobs so i still believe this should be a specialization uh, within the job um i am i am a true believer that architecture academy needs to change 
a lot, uh, especially in traditional countries like Portugal, they need to change, they need to change. I'm, I'm absolutely aware of that. It does not mean that they should be um, embracing the metaverse or, or, or design or like hard, hardcore software designs in architecture. Um, but that was one of the reasons why I started teaching was because I realized that DRL is a niche um, that teaches design in architecture. And I was a designer in architecture since the beginning. In Portugal, you, you don't say uh, architectural designer. It's actually, it goes very bad if you say uh, design in architecture. It makes you feel a little bit less than everyone else, like cheaper or something, I don't know, commercial or pop. I, and I never understood that because I think that deep down I was a designer. Um, but when I was in uni, I did not know that, right? I just knew that my intuition was asking me to do different projects that were not cubes or rectangles. And it was just coming out like wildly for me. So then when I joined DRL, I, it was a very big investment from my parents, which means that it's a niche. It means that not everyone can get it. And that's unfair um, because it's just tools in the end. So I learned the tools. I got a bit of research, which was fun, but the more important part was the mindset and the tools behind it. That, that kind of support the mindset. Um, when, I, when I left and I joined Zaha, I became good at the software that I was the worst at because I did like a lot more work than I was supposed to or I did a lot of work than everyone else to become really good at it, um, which was Maya. And when I became really good and very fast, like almost I could design blind, you know, like really fast, really fast, I decided, you know what, like, I think all these kids, they deserve to learn the tool because the tool does enable your, your vision um, and it's just a tool. So I decided to start teaching Maya. And then after teaching Maya, I decided to start teaching like whole courses, whole studios on let's help these guys on getting into the metaverse with their architecture skills. So I've been teaching for like six years now, been teaching for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, but I love my students. It's one of the best sides of the job. Pretty like, like amazing results. And uh, I often, um, so Jenny, like she's a good friend. Uh, we often yeah. joke around that she's done like the Mariana ma Masters. She's, <laughs> because she's done the whole like, thing. Yeah, yeah. And now she's working at Saha. So, so it's and now she's at Saha. I know, I know. And, it's, and that's also like a very good sign when you have a student that keeps coming back to your courses. Like it means that you build trust. And you build quality. Uh, it is a sign of quality, obviously. And uh, I mean, I also have having her, like, I love having her around. So Jenny is the best. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, we're here at the half hour. So I, uh, like, just like final thoughts, I'm curious, like, what do you, um, I guess, like the new type of architecture studio, I guess for people like your age or, for example, somebody like Tim Fu, who he also started like his own studio um, and he's developing his own uh, thing, also AI power, I would say. Um, but do you think that there's an opportunity now for uh, young architects or designers to develop like a new type of architecture studio that maybe is not as traditional as, as the other ones? Or yeah, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, um, I I'm very torn on what to answer on this because it's really tough. It is really, it's fucking tough. Okay, it's not, it's not as easy as it looks. It's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, it's not as easy as I make it seem like or Tifu makes it seem like. It's actually really hard um, to get a client and and to secure like revenue and income. So would I? I really also want to tell young people, yeah, go for it and. You know, like forget about your conventional job and just jump. And I love telling people to jump. So <laughs> just like go. <laughs> if you are a hard worker and if you are ambitious and if you have the right attitude, go. But right now, my answer will be uh, work on your plan A, uh, secure your stable job for the first three years and start building your plan B at the same time, which is horrible for companies. But this is the reality right now. We can afford to do multiple work. And, and work for multiple incomes and read your contract before obviously and and decide on how transparent you want to be about this but start building your stuff at the same time you're doing your plan a 
uh, we don't have a traditional way of of doing our profession anymore, right? Like our parents, you don't like live and die in one office. Um, so make sure that when you are going through your plan A, which is a boring plan, you're going to hate it. And it's the one you go to at nine, you leave at six. After six, you turn off your computer or you log off and you log in your personal account and you start building your stuff. And I don't mean like building an actual um, physical project, but start building your brand, start building a plan, start building a strategy, start collaborating with other people. It's absolutely major right now and it's so easy to do this over social media. Um, so it's not the time yet for you to leave your boring job and start uh, your company, but have your plan B um, on the side every day. So yeah, it's not easy, Danielle. It's, it's really not easy. It's a lot harder than everyone can imagine. The thing is that I, like from seeing you uh, rise over like the last couple of years is the importance of branding. And, and I think you've been pretty good at that. <laughs> It, it mm -hmm. takes time, obviously, right? But you, you're able to get, you, you have been able to get to a certain point where like people know your brand. Um, yeah. Do you have any advice, uh, I guess, for young architects, like the ones that you're just talking about, um, about branding? Or is, is there yeah. like some methodology to this? It's a very good question. And it's actually something that I disagree with some people. And I know some people disagree with me, like Hamid from Parametric Architecture. We have different views on this. Uh, we had this debate for some time. I'm a true believer uh, that our generation prefers to see the creator behind the projects a lot more than just an account that is bluntly just office and just work. Um, I truly believe that we like transparency now. We like to have a personal um, introduction to the person behind the work. And this is something that I've been building on my social media for years and years, as you know. You know what I'm doing, you know where I work, you know what my workstation looks like. Uh, you know when I left work, you know when I'm on vacations. And it's this whole package that I think we are kind of looking for in, in new architectural or, or new any other jobs. We want the package. We want the creator. We want the lifestyle. We want to know what's your salary. We want to know how are you dealing with your, with your jobs. We want to know how do you get the clients. It's a, a new generation that requires full transparency. I hate accounts that are only based on work they are boring and i had to create one for my own studio to prove hamid wrong <laughs> because he was like no no people don't want to see the creators like no people just want to see the creators we are on the cr content creator time we are we want to see full transparency um so for someone who's building their brand or for someone who's building their own studio make sure that your face is there and make sure that you're approachable, you're humble, uh, you're not like arrogant. It's, you are like the architect next door almost, which is kind of what I am in the end of the day, um, which is all what we all are, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, none of us is better than the other one. And, and these studios that are only live up to their work project content, it kind of makes it feel very like, on an uh, arrogant stage that I'm not a fan of. So just test it, test your own branding, test putting your face out there. Yeah, because there's been recent like observations, for example, like Richard Branson has way more followers than his companies. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah. It's like the face, right? And then he could funnel, I guess, exactly. things to those companies. So I think you do make a good point. I, I kind of agree with you on that. I think, um, we are in the state where people want to see the people behind the work. Um, we want to. We, we want the full transparency. We are used to see that when we open our phones. And, uh, but, but even, for example, uh, Refik Canada, uh, you follow Refik. You don't follow Refik Studio, which I don't even know how it, what it's called. I think it's RAS. I'm not sure. But you follow Refik. Refik is Refik. Uh, even my own account, my studio account is like 1% of my personal account. Um, I think we are just bored of these bluntly, just monotone uh, accounts. I even asked Zaha to do that, and now they have Zaha people, which is cool. It's fun, you know, like they should ha be having kind of a more transparent approach to it, but at least they're showing people, you know, it's not just projects now. It's like it's the ones behind the projects. So yeah, I really believe in that. So give it a go. 
might be completely wrong. Maybe we really don't want to. I mean, to be fair, even with my own account, sometimes I post like my face and I get unfollowing, a lot of unfollowing. Like I go to vacations and my, my follows, Whoa. or then I just show work and my follows. Whoa. So sometimes people are just expecting work. Sometimes people are just expecting personal life. And then sometimes you just build like a stable level of people who like to see both. And that's kind of like the type of people I like to have around. So, and I like before we close up, uh, final words of advice uh, for young architects, and then we'll just leave it at that because this is a pretty good conversation. Yeah, <laughs> um, I would say don't don't feel overwhelmed uh, by the amount of software that you see around. Uh, there is a software that is meant for your skills, and there is a software that is meant for the type of architecture you would like to be doing or the type of architectural phase that you want to be working at. You don't need to know all the softwares. You don't need to run all the, I don't know, mid-journeys or stable decisions, all the apps. You, you just find your own, focus your time on it and become really good at doing that one thing. Um, and that's probably, it's one of the simplest advices and probably the hard, hardest ones to follow. Because that means that you need to reach a level of confidence on yourself that will make you feel comfortable with the fact that you know you are really good at one thing and you have to be comfortable with that. Um, but I can almost like promise you that this is one of the biggest part of the recipe of success. Thank you so much. I uh, really Thank enjoyed you. this conversation. I've been following you for a while, so it's amazing to see what you accomplished in these few years. Congratulations uh, for your page as well, Daniel. <laughs> I saw it growing <laughs> since you did Met the Fluid Studio. And it was you did exactly what I said. You focus on one thing and you became so consistent on the content of that thing. And you're like regular and consistent, regular and consistent. And that's what builds like trust of, on the people. So yeah, congratulations on the page as well. Consistency is actually key. Um, at at least, in, is yeah, true. that's probably besides just being really good at something, uh, being consistent Be is probably consistent. like the other part. Yeah. Um, yeah. One hundred percent. Thank you so much, Mariana, and I. I hope to see like what your studio ends up doing, and we hope to see some really cool projects coming out of you. Uh, and best Yay. wishes for that. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I really hope so. I'm like, oh my God, please. <laughs> see, Let's see. In, we'll come back in, uh, in a year and see where you are. And yeah. It should be pretty yeah. good, yeah. <laughs> Let's set up an, an alarm. All right. Thank you guys for Bye. joining in. And thank you, Mariana. Guys, have a good weekend. Enjoy your week. Have fun. Yeah. Have a good weekend. Yay. It's Friday. Ciao, Daniel. Bye-bye.